Well, hey, this morning we're talking about religion or relationship. You know, and there's one thing about religion. Sometimes when we get focused on that, it can be all about the, the rules and the regulations. And it's not always just the Bible. I mean, we're pretty good at adding on additional <laughs> rules that, that we think might be important. Now, what I'd like to share with you, this might blow you away a little bit, but I want to share with you a couple of, of religious laws that were actually on the books in some of our states in America at one time or another. You might find these interesting. For example, in the state of Nebraska, if a child burps during church, their parents could be arrested. Serious. I'm not getting out of here. It's true. So, so if you have gas as children, watch out. Beware, okay? True. That was not, Now, here, here's another one. In Texas, it is illegal to go to church in disguise. <laughs> Apparently, that was a problem in Texas at one time. You know, Methodists showing up at a Baptist church. <laughs> Who are these people? You know, I, I don't know. But that law was on the books. Here's another one. In Iowa, ministers must obtain a permit to carry their liquor across state lines. <laughs> I want you to know I've got my permit. I'm good. First thing I did coming down from Washington, hey, honey, we got to get our liquor permit, you know. This is California. All right, so we're good. We're good. Uh, in, in Texas, again, they had a lot of extra rules, apparently. Here's one. This was a law on the books. No person may disturb a church service by swearing. Gosh darn it, right. Yeah, so that, that was not okay in, in Texas. Here's one in Oregon. Ministers are forbidden from eating garlic or onions before delivering a sermon. <laughs> and everybody said... You guys crack me up. All right. So <laughs> I don't put onions in my Lucky Charms anymore. I want you to know that. Uh, here's one in Detroit, Michigan. It is illegal. It was illegal at one time in Detroit, Michigan, for a man to scowl at his wife on Sundays. <laughs> Apparently, Monday through Saturday, it was okay. But not on Sundays. No scowling allowed, all right? You could, you could go to the big house for that one. Wow. Here's one in Boston, Massachusetts. It was uh, illegal for two people to kiss in front of a church. <laughs> that could lead to dancing. We know that, right? <laughs> so that's, that's no good. That's no good. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm having too much fun up here. Um, and finally, in West Virginia... <laughs> no member of the clergy is allowed to tell jokes or humorous, humorous stories from the pulpit during a church service. <laughs> well, lock me up and throw away the key. We're, we're done here. So, wow. <laughs> Man. So, not only... Do folks that uh, really focus on religion, you, you know, they're, they're all about kind of the rules, and we, we read laws like that, and we laugh at it. But, you know, I've met people. One guy came up to me and said, hey, you know, I'm all right with God. Tell me about that. He said, well, you know, I, I obey all the Ten Commandments. I said, well, that's a good start. What about the other 603? Did you know they were 613? He kind of looked at me. You know, wow. Um, or or I've, I'd heard folks say, well, you know, hey, I'm, I'm good with God. I've grown up in the church. Or, pastor, I go to church three times a week. All right? I've got to be okay with God. Or, or hey, I, I teach in our children's ministry or, or youth ministry. Or I come and I, I sweep the church once a week. And I know all the right prayers to say. And I, I've memorized, uh, you know, the, the, the order of the books in the New Testament or whatever. We can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on of all this stuff, right? But let me ask this question this morning. Is it possible to do all these things and not have a growing relationship with Jesus? 
Is it possible to do all these things and still walk away feeling that there's something missing inside? And I think that's true, maybe more than we'd like to admit. And so confusion often results, and, and this is where we'll start your notes if you're following along um, in your, uh, in your note sheets that are provided. By the way, it's a new year, 2020. I know you're all excited to be following along on those note sheets. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you in, in that. But confusion can often result when we mistake religious practices or activities for a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. See, religion, when you really boil it down, it's about following per certain practices. It's about substituting what's really important for things of secondary importance. When people ask me, what's your religion? You know, I tell them, I say, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have a religion. I don't use that word. Um, so I'm a follower of Jesus. And that's my prayer, that I would continue to grow in my walk with the Lord and that all of us would put religion behind and enter this new year really growing in our personal relationships with Jesus because religion isn't going to cut it. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth. And I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Not all these religious activities. Not that we won't participate in religious activities or practices. But number one is that relationship with Jesus. And, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So we're starting a new series. You know, when I came here, I felt the Lord uh, kind of moving me to begin with a series on the life of David. And so we were in the Old Testament. And then we took a month to talk about our, our mission and our vision and some of our core values on the wall here, where I'm, which I'm, I'm so excited about. And by the way, if you get bored or lost at any time during my message, that's okay. Just look at the walls, all right? Let those seep in. Okay, by osmosis, as we live into those things. So as we came to the new year, I thought, you know, it's time, it's time to, to give the people, we need to talk about Jesus. It's time to talk about Jesus. It's time to get into the New Testament, to get into the Gospels. Um, I love to teach on Jesus. I love to talk about Jesus. And so this new series that we're going to begin our new year with is called Jesus Face to Face. And we are going to look at some random encounters that people had with the Messiah face to face. And I think through these encounters as we study them that, that our faith is going to be challenged. And my hope is that we'll fall more and more in love with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning... We're going to eavesdrop on a conversation that Jesus had with a prominent religious leader at night. But before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Lord, every day you give us is a gift. And we thank you for today, and we thank you for a new year. I pray that you would be with us in our lives, in our pursuits, our activities, our ambitions. I pray that you'd be with our church, that we would continue to reach more and more people in this community for you, but that through all of that, that we would always keep our focus on you, on growing in our relationship with you each and every day. Help us to do that, Father. In your name we pray, amen. So, how do we move from religion to relationship? What does that mean? Well, first it means this, that we embrace our identity in Christ. And that looks at the question of, of who I belong to. 
So as we get into our story here, if you've got your Bibles or you've got it on your phone or somewhere, let's get to John chapter 3. All right, let's all get there. And it says this, now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, there's a lot there. So first of all, we find that, that a Pharisee named Nicodemus, all right, he, he comes to Jesus. Now, Pharisees were a religious sect of the Jews, and they're the ones that really took all the rules and regulations very seriously. Not that that was a bad thing, but if you look at some of the Pharisees and religious leaders that Jesus interacted with during his ministry, typically they were prideful. Typically, they had lost the big picture, the focus on God and what he was doing, and were much more concerned about dotting every I, crossing every T of the rules and regulations of their faith. And it says that he was a ruler of the Jews. That meant that Nicodemus was not only you know, a, a Pharisee, one who was devoted and committed to the law, he taught others, um, but he was ruler of the Jews. That meant he was a part of this exclusive club of 70 leaders called the Sanhedrin during Jesus' time. And they were the Pharisees of the Pharisees. They had religious and political authority over the Jews. Uh, they had their long robes, their priestly garments. They would walk in the marketplaces and people would greet them with respect. They would be given the chief seats at the banquets when they were invited over to dinner. That sort of thing. He was, he was that kind of guy. And yet Jesus had come to Jerusalem. And it was the Passover, the Bible tells us. And Jesus had kind of just started. This, this is the early part of his three-year ministry. And he was, he was performing some signs in Jerusalem. And, and the Pharisees had seen this. And, and Nicodemus wanted to find out, who is this guy? Who is this young rabbi, this teacher? He must be from God because of the signs that he's doing. But he didn't approach Jesus in the daytime. Why? Well, that would have been too conspicuous. <laughs> a man of his stature, of his identity, of his importance, engaging this unknown person, this Jesus, that wouldn't be acceptable. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Maybe he took him off to the side. Maybe, maybe they had a little fire. And the leader of the Jews came and, and said, Rabbi, you must be from God because of all these signs that you do. Now, this is really interesting. So Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, in the Gospel of John, anytime we read truly, truly, that means this is really important, okay? Truly, truly, Jesus is saying, this is the way it is. Um, and you might want to use this. It's kind of like, you know, my wife. She'll give me a list to get some things at the grocery store. And I am notorious for not coming home with half the things she asked for. Because I space out, all right? So she'll say to me, husband, truly, truly, I say unto you. <laughs> this is important, all right? Get the milk, get the bread, get the meat, okay? Don't. Truly, truly, all right? So, if you really want something done, whether it's at work or with your kids or your spouse, just begin the sentence like that. Assistant manager, truly, truly, I say unto you. <laughs> and they'll look at you like this. Huh? You'll have their attention. So, Jesus starts. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again? What's that? That term has never been used in Scripture before. And so Nicodemus says to Jesus, all right. And he's, he's, try, he's trying to put two and two together. Okay, Jesus, so uh, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
So it's kind of comical. You've got this very dignified man who probably his identity and who he is is all wrapped up in uh, being uh, a religious leader of the people. He knows his theology. He knows the rules and regulations. He's memorized most of the Old Testament scriptures. (laughs) And Jesus says, here's what's really important. Unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Mind-blowing to Nicodemus. Okay, And, And all he can try to do is say, what is this young man talking about? What? you got to be born again? And he's thinking in literal terms. How are you going to go back up your mother's womb? That's, he knows biology. That's not how it works. What are you talking about? All right? So then Jesus explains it. He goes on in, uh, in verse 5 and 6 where he says, Truly, truly, again, this is important. He says, I say to you, unless one is born of water... When a woman's water breaks, the baby is ready to come. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he explains it. That which is born of flesh is flesh. All right? We're all born through the flesh. That's God's way. But then he says, but that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. He's talking about that spiritual rebirth. Um, And we know that's true in Scripture. The Apostle Paul taught in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 to uh, 14. And we'll put this on the screen. And he's writing to the Ephesians. And Paul says, now in, in him, in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Something permanent happened. You put your faith and trust in Jesus and God then sealed that decision, that choice with his Holy Spirit, his very presence indwelling you. And and that's your deposit which is a guarantee of the heavenly inheritance that you will one day enjoy. So Jesus begins that conversation with Nicodemus as Paul works it out in the early church. Now, (laughs) Nicodemus is trying to listen to all this, and he's really blown away because he's the guy that everybody came to with their Bible questions. He's the guy that knew what to say. He he was the guy that the people looked to as having that close relationship with God. And now this young man, this rabbi, this teacher is saying these things, and and he's just, he's beside himself. He, He doesn't know how to respond. And so Jesus says in verse 7 of John 3, don't marvel Nicodemus, <laughs> he's marveling. He's just like, what are you talking about? And Jesus says, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus, he's talking about these things birth and and the wind to try to help Nicodemus connect the dots to understand what God is doing now. And it's blowing him away. (laughs) Nicodemus answers in verse 9, well, how can these things be? He just, it's, it's blowing his identity out of the water. Jesus is rocking his world here. How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? In other words, you're the guy. You're the guy? And you don't get this? That's what Jesus is saying. You don't don't get this? You don't understand these things? Wow. He he truly didn't. Jesus uh, expects him 
to know the scriptures so well that he would understand some of the prophecies and some of the teachings in the Old Testament, like in the book of Ezekiel. I'm not going to go to it, but I think you've got it in your notes where the prophet talks about God pouring out his spirit on his people. Well, that time had come. And that's the connection Jesus was hoping for. But I think what's going on behind the scenes is that Nicodemus's identity uh, as a Pharisee, as a follower of all the, all the rules and all the regulations, he's trying to be devout. He's truly trying to follow the Lord, and yet I think his identity was kind of wrapped up in that. And the things that Jesus was talking about was just blown away. He had no, he had no reference for it. Jesus was saying, what you've got, Nicodemus, is not enough. You need to be born again. You need the Holy Spirit. You need me. Hmm. You know, I, th I think that's a good question for all of us to ask ourselves. You know, what do we base our identity in? Probably a lot of things. Who do we base our identity in? You know, it could be sports or family or jobs or whatever. I mean, let's just, let's just look at sports, all right? Um, if I... If I bring this T-shirt out, for example, this jersey, all right? Does anybody identify with this? Right. And if you're an Oakland A's fan, you're cursing your pastor right now, right? So, so okay, yeah, we, we identify as Giants fans, right? Or if you really want to get cantankerous, right? Well, lucky I'm a Giants fan. <laughs> No idea how that got in there. But, see, got a reaction there. Now, let me show you what I got for Christmas. Garoppolo's good, but he's got a way to go till he gets to my man Joe, all right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, we might identify ourselves as, as sports fans, um, <laughs> And, and we might identify ourselves through our jobs as well. I'm a teacher, or I'm a banker, or I'm a, I'm a lawyer, or a doctor, or, you know, I, I, I'm in construction, or I do this, or I do that, or we might identify ourselves from a position of our wealth, or from our accomplishments, or, or our family, all these different things. And it can be easy for identities to get a little clouded. I got to tell you, in my... Uh, uh, my years of being a minister, when I've been between churches, sometimes I will have a little identity crisis. And I would sit in my home office and throw my little personal pity party. And uh, my wife would come in and say, you're pathetic. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, but, but I don't have a church to pastor. I don't have anybody to teach or to talk to. She says, listen, your identity isn't in being a pastor. Your identity is to belong to Jesus, Amen. you knucklehead. You know? And she's right. She's right. So in this new year, let's look at our identity. The number one, the number one aspect of our identity as believers in Christ is that he is our identity, Amen. that we're his children. Secondly, the way to move from religion to relationship means, secondly, that we understand our salvation in Christ. And that looks at the question, what we believe. So now, Jesus has kind of <laughs> cracked the subject open with Nicodemus. He's got him thinking about his identity. Is it all about being a Pharisee and a religious leader? And now he, he challenges his belief system. And so we get to verse 11 and 12 in John 3, and Jesus says this, truly, truly, there you go, again, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and he's saying now, I'm the son of God. You might be the leader of the Jews religiously, and you don't even know it, but the God that you worship, that's my father. And I and the Father are one. Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, 
We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. What wasn't Nicodemus receiving? Well, typically, the Jews had not interpreted the message of the prophets correctly. Really, if Nicodemus was the sharpest tool in the shed, he would have been observing Jesus and looking at the scriptures and maybe, just maybe, he would have had the insight to say, could this be the Messiah? But we don't see that here. Could this be the Messiah? And Jesus said, listen, we, uh, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. He says, if I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, if I talk about uh, being born again, if I talk about the wind, if I talk about these earthly things and you don't get it, Nicodemus, he says, how are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? I I've tried to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, Nicodemus. I've tried to make it easy here. And if anybody should understand this stuff, it should be you. But you're not getting it. And I think Jesus loved him. I don't think Jesus is necessarily condemning him or trying to make him feel bad. He's just trying to open his eyes to what God was doing at that moment in time. Hmm. And then Jesus goes on, and, and he starts to explain some heavenly things to him. He says, listen... Uh, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That was Jesus' favorite way to describe himself, as the Son of Man. And he was saying, here's the deal. I was with God the Father, and I descended to save you. I descended to show God's love. To you. And then he goes on, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus uses this kind of weird analogy back in the Old Testament where um, the, the Jewish people were complaining against God, and they were being rebellious against God, and so God sent a bunch of snakes on the Jews, and they bit them, and a bunch of them died, and they cried out, they said, we're sorry, God. Please, bring us relief. And so God told Moses, make a, make a, make a serpent out of bronze and, and lift it up. And when the people look at this serpent, if they've been bitten, they'll be healed. And Jesus takes that analogy and he says, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, so must I be lifted up on the cross. He's prophesying about his death, which would happen about two years later, that whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And Nicodemus has never heard this stuff before. And then Jesus shares with him, Nicodemus gets the privilege of hearing for the very first time probably the most familiar verse in all of Scripture. And Jesus goes on, Nicodemus for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. Did that give you chills? It's amazing to hear that verse in context. And Nicodemus got to hear that. The gospel summed up in one verse. So eloquently, so truthfully, so lovingly from Jesus. And Jesus goes on and he says, For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's what religion does. It condemns. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He's hoping that Nicodemus will connect the dots. I'm the Son of God. I am the Messiah that you've waited for for seven, eight hundred years. Come on, Nicodemus. God loves you so much. He sent me, his son, God himself. Come on, man. 
open up your thinking. Your Messiah has arrived. But notice, Jesus didn't ask Nicodemus to do more. He didn't ask Nicodemus to know more. He didn't ask Nicodemus to be more holy. He's asking Nicodemus to put his faith and his trust in him. That's what Jesus is asking. And then he'll see the kingdom of God. You see, it's not about what we do. (laughs) It's about what's been done. Right? So many people, man, their faith, their religion, it's all bound up in what they do. Are we supposed to do? Yeah, we're supposed to do good works. But it's really about what's been done. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the Christ. One person said it this way, you spell your religion D-O, I spell mine D-O-N-E. It's done. It's done. Right? One of Steven Spielberg's probably most impactful movies was called uh, Saving Private Ryan, if you saw that. And the whole premise of the movie is that uh, Tom Hanks plays Captain Miller. And he's leading his small group of men through the drama and the danger of D-Day in World War II. And they make it onto uh, French soil. And then uh, uh, Tom Hanks and his men get a strange mission. They said, listen, there's this private. His name is Ryan. And he's behind enemy lines in France. And your mission is to go find him. And to bring him back alive so that we can send him home. Because three of his brothers have already died in the war. And we don't want to send one more body back to his mother. And so the movie is based on Tom Hanks and his men facing the dangers of the, of the Germans, trying to find this Private Ryan, and several of them lose their lives. And at one point, Tom Hanks, is, Captain Miller, is talking to his men. He says, man, this Ryan guy better be worth it. He, he better come back and, you know, invent some sort of great cure for the diseases that we face. Or he, he, he better come back and, you know, invent a better light bulb, <laughs> something like that. And they're talking. So they find Ryan, and there's a final battle scene, and Captain Miller takes a bullet, and, uh, Tom, and Private Ryan, played by Matt Damon, is kneeling by his side, and as Tom Hanks' character is dying, he looks at the young private, and he says, earn this. Earn it. And then he died. Flash forward 50 years later, Private Ryan has gone back safely. He's married and he's got children and grandchildren of his own, and they come back to the beaches of Normandy where those men had lost their lives. And he kneels down before the grave marker of Captain Miller. And he says, I tried to live my life as best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope I earned what you did for me. The last words of Jesus were not earn it. The last words of Jesus were, it is finished. It is finished. Nicodemus perhaps was putting his self-esteem, his worth before God and following all the rules and regulations of the Old Testament law. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. And yet, our salvation is not based on our works. It's based on what Jesus did on the cross for us. Amen? It is finished. Paul understood this. When he said in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith, not of your works. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We're saved by grace through faith. 
Thirdly, as we close, moving from religion to relationship means that we live in the light of Christ, how we behave. So Jesus is talking about our identity in him. Religion is not going to get you there. He then talks about what's really important, and that's being born again through the Son of God and his sacrifice that's going to come for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he says, once your identity is set and you understand what you believe, now you'll live in the light. And so Jesus says in verses 19 and 21, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world. He's talking about himself. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. A lot of break-ins and crime and violence, it happens at night. We do the dirty deeds at night so they won't be seen. And Jesus is saying, but I've come. The light is coming to the world. The light has come into the world. He's saying... Now your behavior needs to change as we live in the light. Verse 21, Jesus said, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Hmm. See, the, out, the natural outflow of our relationship with the Lord, putting our identity in Christ, understanding what we believe, that should lead to a life of gratitude, naturally, and living in the light of Jesus. That means that our words, our thoughts, our actions, our motives, our attitudes, our decisions reflect our identity and what we believe. So for 2020, let me put this on the screen, live into your identity in Christ by letting your beliefs influence your behavior. That's how I would wrap up this message. That's what Jesus is trying to say to Nicodemus in this face-to-face -face conversation. <clears throat> well, we might ask, what happened to Nicodemus? Did this make a difference at all? I think it did. Later in Jesus' ministry, when the Pharisees were ready and plotting to kill him because of his popularity and his authority and the impact he was making with the people, they were following him more than they were following the religious leaders and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were ready to, to be really intentional and take Jesus out. It was Nicodemus who stood up before them and said, wait, if he's not from God, this thing will just fizzle out. But if he is from God, we're not going to be able to stop him. Nicodemus said that amidst the religious leaders. And then finally, we find at the death of Jesus that Nicodemus is mentioned as one who came and brought spices and helped prepare Jesus' body for burial. I think Nicodemus moved from religion to relationship in the end. How about you? I want to encourage you, church, family, friends. Let's not move into this new year just going through, you know, the motions of religion. Let's truly focus on our relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and live in his light each and every day.